Hey, good morning. Uh, I'm Ben Hickey, the curator of exhibitions at the Hilliard Art Museum. And of course, this is Roger Ogden. Uh, I'm deeply honored and excited to be with you today. Um, and, and this event, as well as last night's, is, is meant to celebrate what you hold dear, the art of the South, you know? Um, and, and while we're putting together Envisioning the South, I have to say it was an amazing experience. I felt like uh, you were available. I learned so much from you. I learned so much from Bradley and Richard and Joe and Ken as well. Um, it, was a, it was a great opportunity for me and the Hilliard to really move our institutional knowledge of, this, of Southern art in, more into the first person. Um, so I'm really grateful. I'm really grateful for that, so thank you. Um, and, and so this project, Envisioning the South, has two competing goals. And one is to illustrate the quality and breadth of your collection, of course. You know, its prominence in terms of setting the intellectual agenda for art of the South. And the, the other is to give insight and to profile you as a collector and understand your approach to connoisseurship and your personal, your personal story in tandem, interwoven with the art that we're going to be discussing. So I'm, I'm very eager to, to go down this path with you. Okay. And so, <coughs> um, you know, Bradley touched on Drisdale's Blue Lagoon City Park. And, uh, but I'd like to know what really, what was it specifically that captured your imagination about this particular work that set you down this path? You know, honestly, Ben, I don't think I could have said it better than Bradley said it. Um, um, it, it he hit it spot on. Um, first of all, I, I, I was literally taken when I first laid eyes on the work at the Taylor Clark Gallery. And, and, and secondly, what immediately came to my mind is uh, Lafayette, South Louisiana, Southwest Louisiana, Bayou Country. And, I really thought, honestly, before I learned better, that it looked like the Bayou Tesh. It spent a lot of time down, down the Iberia Way and in the shadows and all of that. So it just it reminded me of place, my home. Well, and and so as, it, and as you began looking at more art after this, this set the tone. You told me that there are two things that define your collecting. <laughs> your entrepreneurial spirit and then also your eye. Can you elaborate on how those, the mechanics of how that works when you're looking at a work of art? Well, I think the entrepreneurial side of it is uh, overarching and all-encompassing because I'm, I'm not an art historian. I can't tell you how many curators and directors over the years since I started collecting you know, over the last 40 years plus, 50 years, <laughs> after I got started and we were really building something that, um, that turned into something I never intended uh, uh, in the beginning, um, I, I, I'm, I, I, who have told me, please, don't take an art history class. <laughs> Just be you. And, and I, I got it. I got what they were talking about, and, 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 and it was that it's a genuine and fresh look at art by an untrained, uneducated, art educated guy. And, 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 and so after, after getting this first work and, and it, was ex it was actually a Christmas present for my mom and, and my dad and I, I, I finally got him to go to the gallery with me in October uh, of that year. And, he, and, it, and he had asked me to help find a, a Christmas present for my mom. And, and, um, and my, my girlfriend, Nancy Harris at the time, still an artist, uh, um, we, he, said, he said, he was smitten with Nancy to begin with, and he said, uh, why don't you get Nancy to help you? you know, and I said, okay, I'll do that, and I did. And so, so anyway, unrelated to that, um, this event happened to occur in, in, in like 
early October, and and uh, before, before, right after that, he asked me that, and and I and I saw this work, and I didn't even I didn't connect the two at the time. I only connected <laughs> later, and and Bradley had it r right. Uh, the next day, uh, leaving the fraternity house and walking across the parade ground to my first uh, uh, morning class, um, it was a gorgeous uh, October day in Louisiana, and. And uh, I was thinking about that painting. I couldn't get it out of my mind. And, and, and then uh, went to the class, came back to, for lunch at the fraternity house, and on the way back, all of a sudden it dawned, well, that's great, Roger, but how are you going to pay for it? <laughs> you don't have, I mean, I was a college kid with nothing, you know, I mean, and uh, gas money and fraternity dues, and that was about it. And, and so, uh, the light bulb literally went off coming back across the campus and and it was what all college kids do when they have a financial crisis <laughs> mom and dad you know in this case dad and and then I connected those two things looking for a Christmas present and all that because I, I didn't I mean I, I I, I, I didn't have to own it, you know, it didn't need to be mine, but if it was in our family, you know, I, I, could, it could, I could be a part of it. And, and, but it was a real chore, as Randy alluded to. In, in fact, Madeline, you need to tell Paul that, that the way I finally, got, he, 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 I told him Nancy and I had found something for Mama, and he said, great, great, what is it? You know, I said, no, it's a surprise, I'm not gonna tell you. And he said, well, no, no, come on now. Is it jewelry? No. Is it, you know, anyway, I went down the list, you know, perfume? No. I said, just when you're here in town for the Ole Miss game next week, leave mom at the hotel, come pick me up at the fraternity house, and we'll go. And so he did. He came and he got out, and I jumped behind the wheel, and we headed out Dalrymple Drive around, around the lakes to, to Government Street, and then right on Government to, uh, to the Taylor Clark Gallery. And he's still pumping, pumping, wanting to know well, what it. And so we turn into the to the gallery and part right in front, and 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 it was a low windshield. And he's looking like this, and just says across Taylor Clark Art Gallery, and he, he did just as 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 Bradley said. He just turned to me and he said, "Buster, my nickname." He said, "We don't know we don't know anything about art." And I said, "Well, yes." But, you know, Mom painted those silhouettes of Jean Lafitte that you made the frames for in the, in the, um, in the den. And he said, yeah, but that's your mom. We don't, I said, well, we're looking for a Christmas present for Mom, right? And he said, yeah, but she knows what she likes and she would be. But, and we, you know, we're, we're just two, you know, we're just two guys. And, and, uh, <laughs> and. He wasn't going to get out of the dadgum car. So, Madeline, this is where Paul, Paul comes in. So, I, I just couldn't get, <clears throat> and my, you know, all, all oil and gas guys, whether they were geologists or engineers, uh, you know, they, they have basically a science kind of mindset in a mind. And so, he had told me when I was in the eighth grade at, at Hamilton at the UL um, lab school, he had told me one time, and because I was kind of aware, you know, at 13 years old, <clears throat> that maybe things had not been super successful on the drilling front. <laughs> and, and so I, I just asked him one day, Daddy, are we in trouble? You know, and he said, well, no. And he said, but yes. And I said, well, how many dry holes in a row have you drilled? And he said, well, I, it's, it's, it's 10. And I said, I said, you sure we're not in trouble? And he said... No, well, look, he said, Buster, he said, so here's, here's the way the oil business works. He said, you know, you could get two completions in a row. That can happen. You can get five. You can, you can get 10 dry holes in a row. He said, but on average, when you take all the data for the kind of drilling and, and, and plays that we're working, we're, which were shallow inland, not, not real shallow, mid, you know, 10,000 feet, uh, not big, huge, expensive, like offshore wells going down to 20,000, well, 25,000. And he said, <clears throat> he said, so on average, if you, if you hit one completion, it will pay for a dozen dry, dry holes. And, and, and so I knew we were at 10. <laughs> <laughs> and he came to me, the 11th, the 11th completed, and it was a really good well for him. 
And so what I did, Madeline, with, with, uh, with, with him was I said, look, Daddy, okay, look, because <laughs> he thinks like a scientist and odds and all these kind of things. I said, if you'll just go in with me, I'm going to take you to this one gallery um, in, in the in, in this sub gallery. In the, and I said, I think there are about a dozen paintings on it. And I told him, reminding him of that story because it had been 10 years before, I reminded him of that story. And I said, so, Daddy, I don't know. I didn't count how many paintings in there, but I'm guessing it was around 12. And I said, if you don't, if you, and what I said at the time was, if you don't like, I mean, today we would say, if you don't respond, or <laughs> you know, man, if you don't like this, this painting that Nancy and I have, have picked out um, from mom, then we'll call the deal off. And so he pretty quickly did his calculation. He said, hell, one in 12, I'll get out of the car. <laughs> he get, and he, that's what he told me. He said, one in 12? Yeah, that's it. He said, oh, okay, we'll go look. Well, he did exactly the same thing I did. I mean, this painting was hanging on the wall opposite the entrance, like all you curators do. You place things yeah, of like the two that you had at the end, the, the, the Brock Moore, Bill Matthews, and the Miller Wall abstract. Um, and so he got to the door just like I had done, and he didn't even look around, didn't look at anything else like I didn't either originally. And, and he said, it's that one, isn't it? I said, yes, sir, it is. And he said, well, <laughs> you know, uh, and so I got Mr. Clark, Taylor Clark, George's dad to come in and, and tell him the story about Drisdale. And it, it turned out it's not Bayou Desh, it's Bayou St. John in City Park that he painted a thousand times. Um, and, and so he relented. And we bought the, 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 the painting for my mom. So it was, it, you know, it's hanging in the exhibit. It's a pretty decent sized painting. And so, so <clears throat> I picked it up and we went home for Christmas and, and, uh, and the Clark folks had wrapped it up. And, and so I, I get it out of the trunk and, uh, and, 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 and take it into the house. And of course, you know, my mom said, well, what's that? And who's that for? She was, she was like a little kid, curious, you know, and, 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 uh, and, and so it sat under the tree for, I guess it was probably 10 days till Christmas came <clears throat> after I got home and, and she, she was feeling it and she could, be, she could feel a frame, you know, and so, I mean, she knew it was either a mirror <laughs> or some kind of artwork because it was in a frame and, and so she didn't get it out of us. She wasn't sure. So Christmas morning comes and we opened everything else. And then she was sitting on the floor, uh, kind of Indian style. And, and we got the present and brought it over to her. And my dad was standing, he on her right so shoulder and me on her left shoulder. And she starts opening it. And, and he's looking at me and, and kind of like I did when, in Randy's introduction last night. I, I, I broke out and he broke out of sweating his brow. He was really worried about this and, and and sweating it in real virtual terms. And and I was kind of too, but anyway, it was from him to her, uh, with me being the uh, the, the scout. Um, and so when you know she opened it, it was the back of it. So we had to turn it around and and she 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 we and I finished pulling the paper off, and she still she was sitting there looking at it. Didn't look at him. Didn't look at me. Didn't say a word for what seemed like five minutes. It was probably forty seconds. Um, he's sweating. I'm I'm sweating. And she turns to him first, to her right, and didn't say a word. And then she turned to me on the left, and there were tears coming down. No kidding. And she said to the two of us after she looked at both of us, she said, I can't, these are her exact words, I can't believe, Cherie, you can picture this, I cannot believe you two oafs had enough sensitivity to get me the best present I've ever gotten. <laughs> and so, boy, that lighted the fire and, and, and for him. So I go back to school. That's a little bit of a long story. I won't be as long with it, but you get back to school. And so January went by and February went by. 
And in those, I mean, there were no cell phones in the 1960s, so we had a wall phone and on each floor of the attorney house, and the pledges would answer it. And so my parents never called me when I, I'd call them about every other week and check in and and uh, off to see how my dog Revel was. Uh, Sheree, you remember Revel? And and uh, and and so um, the pledge came. Kind of Tom, Tom to, kind, of, kind of came to our, our room, and Paul and I, my roommate, now we're studying. And he said, uh, Roger, it's your dad on the phone. He needs to talk to you. And I said, You sure it's me? He said, Yeah. And I'm in my skitties and t shirt. It was absolutely Tom Cruise before Tom Cruise did the slide and risky business. I mean, I had my socks on. I hit that call, and I probably slid for 10 feet. To get that phone, I remember I went past it, got the phone off the wall, and I said, Daddy, and I said, what's up? What's wrong? And he said, oh, nothing's wrong. Buster everything. I said, no, really. I said, Is Mama okay? You know, y'all, your mom's fine. Are you okay? I'm absolutely fine. Are Mom and Papa okay, my grandparents? They're fine. Everybody's fine. I said, it's Rebel, isn't it? He said, no, <laughs> Rebel is fine. I promise you. I said, well, what's up? You know? And he said, well, there's something I want to talk to you about. And, and uh, I said, okay. And he started him and hawing. And, and I said, well, Daddy, just spit it out. You know, what, what, what's up? And he said, well, you know that painting we gave your mama for Christmas? I said, yes, sir. He said, you know, it went over really well. I said, yes, sir. And he said, well, since you left, it's actually done me a lot of good with your mother, if you know what I mean. And I said, I don't want to know anymore. I don't, don't tell me anymore. I've heard enough, you know. And, and he said, so can you and Nancy find one for our, our anniversary in, uh, in or her birthday in April was what it was. So that's how it all started. I mean, it was as simple as that. It was a couple of oaths. Um, and, and, and to answer the intent of your question, yes, it was the sense of place. And that that and my entrepreneur. Then later, the entrepreneurship came in. After we started doing this, I realized that I think we put together ten works from my mom before he died. Only three years later, at the age of forty-nine, unexpectedly, totally without warning. And and so she treasured those ten works, as you can imagine. And and uh, and I learned uh, over those acquisitions. I learned a lot from Taylor Clark. I learned a lot from some of the conservators that we used. Um, and it became apparent to me that um, that there just was no one else doing this. There was no one interested in Louisiana at the time, Louisiana art, uh, especially historical art. And um, and and that that challenge that that. That challenges who I am as a person because I, I, I love entrepreneurship. I am an entrepreneur. I am not an art historian. But it challenged me to say to myself, well, they should know about it. You know, they, sh they should know about it, and I'm going to do something about it. And I still didn't have any funding, but that was the thought. So that, that leads me to the next thing I'd like to talk about is because history and the story is always key to learning anything from you and i wanted to know about key acquisitions and the years those things were happening and i we had discussed the possibility of laying the show out in order of acquisition year and you intuitively hated that idea yeah but you didn't fully understand why right um and so can can you like you did the other day elucidate that can, can you talk us through why that was the case? Well, you're responsible. <laughs> <laughs> you're responsible. I mean, I knew uh, instinctively yeah. that uh, the idea of, of, of structuring this, this show and this exhibit uh, around the date of acquisition in the book that's coming um, wasn't right. Um, and I kept telling you that it's opportunistic, it's, it's entrepreneurial. But you saw, well, it was more than that. Whether you knew, Roger, what you were, you didn't tell me this, but whether you knew what you were doing or not, there is, there is, a, there is, a, there is a little planning here. And, and in hindsight, I, I realized, yes, there, there was some planning, but, but it was if that the, the, the larger planning that 
that came to be later in the after I did have discretionary income, and I really began collecting in earnest, which would have started in the in the late seventies and and uh, in the early eighties, and 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 what what became a plan uh, from learning was all born out of this entrepreneurial opportunistic spirit that as I said, overarched everything. And then the plan came into being. And so maybe in the, in the time of acquisition, I may have, have acquired um, uh, historical landscapes first. Uh, and remember, I'm learning all the time because this is totally self-learned. Uh, no, no, no art history classes, no, nothing. And, and, and so I was learning, sponging just up all along the way. And as I did that, I saw I saw uh, uh, still lifes, and I saw um, other other media, and and uh, other than all on canvas, and 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 so it, it it provoked that entrepreneurial spirit to find more, and to from 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 what you're doing have a purpose, and. A, a value creation because we capitalists, you know, we 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 create value, and and hopefully we share that value with good good works, yeah. like the Hillier, you know, and and but at any rate, um, so I still, in fact, Bradley, are you st is Bradley still here? Yeah. Where are you? Oh, okay. So in fact, Bradley knows that that I made a recent acquisition. Of a, of a right out of the beginning the acquisitions of a William Henry Buck. And, and uh, it was a big acquisition, shall we say. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm still applying for a, 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 a paid doorman or docent at the Ogden uh, after acquiring that work. But it, we had to have it. We just had to have it. And um, it's the best that exists. And, and so if you did it by acquisition, you know, if, if, it, if it was all historical art or, and then all uh, still lives or, you know, graduating. And the, now there were, that we've discussed, and I know you're gonna go there, there were uh, uh, epiphanies along the way and revelations that uh, as I learned more and, and uh, was challenged more um, to go into other, realms of, of, of art, um, styles and, and, and stylistic tones that, that, um, that do come into play. But the, and so that's where you were getting the acquisitions. Yeah, I didn't acquire any abstract art until that, that Colmire, but. Yeah. I'm glad it happened this way though, yeah. because we came by it naturally. Yep. And to have done it that way would have diminished your thinking because as you said, the thinking about the acquisitions is much longer term oftentimes mm -hmm. than the actualization of an acquisition. So mm -hmm. I think that the, the, current, the current layout is far superior because of that. But in terms of your patterns, you always start in Louisiana regardless. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you're t taking on a new venture intellectually, mm -hmm. if you're collecting, you, mm -hmm. you come back home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so these are two great examples of Louisiana artists that that you did that with early on. Mm -hmm. And so why why is that the pattern? Do you have a sense of that? Well, this is why I love having third party eyes like yours and like Bradley's. And uh, it look, you know, I w was not conscious of that. But it is true. Uh, it is absolutely true that I sort of start at home and then venture out um, when I'm probing new new fields of art that I haven't um, um, explored before, whether it's photography or abstract art, um, um, sculpture, uh, other things. And 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 so. Um, you awaken me to something about myself in, in asking that 
that question. And, it, and, and I've already said, it is true. I did that. I can't tell you why I did that. I honestly cannot tell you, except that we human beings tend to kind of start with what we know or with home. We always kind of come home, witness <laughs> last night and, and this, this coming home celebration that, uh, that you all put together for me. Well, now my, I have great trepidation about this because you said people said never take a class and I don't want to make you too self-aware of anything that you're doing. Yeah, well, no, that's okay. Self-awareness is great. Uh, well, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. If things go downhill from here, it'll be all my fault. <laughs> That's right. That, that, isn't that what Louis Ann does to you too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Bradley's fault. If got a curator. Yeah, we'll, we'll certainly see how that goes. Yeah. Um, but you know, these are these are examples. This is a quick follow up, and you know, we don't have to spend any time. But again, like working and looking towards art in different styles, different realms, different regions after the fact, but you know, North Carolina, back to New Orleans, very eclectic. Yes, yes, yeah. No matter what, being eclectic. And I think that the, the best example of how important that is, is your total disregard for hierarchy in art. Yes. You know, the photography, which I think now in 2023, people acknowledge photography as high, fine art. Yep. But when you started in the beginning, that wasn't necessarily universal. It may still not be, I'm not sure, but we don't talk to those people. Um, so, you know, I think the Clementine Hunter piece, which Bradley introduced so well already, is a great example of that. Do you, do you consciously think about vernacular art or photography as your as you're doing this? No, uh, I, 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 for the most part, no. For the most part, no. Um, okay, th th this is where the entrepreneurial button gets pushed and the opportunistic um, uh, part comes into play. So if you go back to the previous slide, um, so, and then the one before that. Okay, so, so the, the <clears throat> the Hattie Saucy on, on the right um, and the Walter Anderson on the left. Um, I had put together, as Bradley knows, we put together uh, before this Blue Jays w was acquired and Ken knows too, probably what, 30 or 35 Walter Andersons, um, some of the greatest Walter and the big ones that he did in Goche, Mississippi, when he just got out of the out of the uh, um, the mental institution, and and uh, and so really didn't need any more. But I saw this blue jay at, at auction, and I mean it was kind of like the Drisdale in that day, but a little bit more experience under my belt and knowledge, and but it just knocked me over. I remember telling Ken, "We have to get we have to get that work," and. And looking at it last night on the wall with Ken when we were just two of us looking, because um, it, 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 these are all our babies, you know, kind of, and 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 we get reacquainted because there's a lot. I mean, we're we're I mean we're around two thousand works now, so that's why the d database and and uh, and and yes to uh, to 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 quote. Uh, uh, Luella, Luann and, and, and William, you know, um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really sick with the disease. <laughs> I mean, it, and it is, it is definitely, I, I, I try to take something, you know, to cure me of collecting and it just doesn't work. But when you see and you have this blessing, whether you're an athlete and you're blessed with great speed or leaping ability or, or whatever, when you're blessed with an eye, and it is a blessing, it's in anything I earned, it is just a blessing. And, and you, you, you have a purpose now. And the purpose is, uh, is to build uh, this greatest collection of Southern art that exists in the world. And it will, for the most part, go to the Ogden. Um, I mean, 
it's all going to go there except for a few things that Field wants, like the portrait of Ken and me and some things. And the, and the Colmar, the, the, the original Colmar, he's told me, <laughs> don't you give that away yet. You know? So, so he, his, his, his actual line is, you've already given away my inheritance, but there's a couple of things that sentimentally I would like. It. But to get back on track, that, that when you see, whether it's that recent buck or, or this Walter Anderson, you see and you know it by this time. Um, it was a relatively recent acquisition within the last few years, the, the Anderson. Um, and it's amongst the greatest that exists. It's just real hard to hold that inclination to uh, want to get that for the museum, you know, and, and, and for the collection. And so, so that's what happened with that Blue Jay. And walking through last night, just Ken and I, what I say about that Blue Jay? What I say? It's the best Anderson, I think, that we have. Bradley? I mean, there are some great ones that we have in those 36 or 38, whatever they are, but... And 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 I and I love Ben and Bradley. I love the deco, the deco influence on on the way he and he. It's not the only one he's done others, but they're not as plentiful as uh, as his, his regular ones. And and so combination of all that, it just had to be. We didn't need it. Museum didn't need any more because we've also had other gifts of Walter Anderson from others, and we we we. We, it, we just, well, he's such a great artist and we, we're going to have him knocked out. But on the Hattie Saucy, she, she is a, uh, she's a, uh, a Savannah-based artist, uh, woman, um, working uh, at a time when, uh, this is a 1930 work, working at a time when women really weren't uh, accepted as professional artists. Uh, uh, think about uh, think about in this time frame um, um, a little earlier even uh, of uh, oh, uh, been um, the great American female impressionist that had to go to France. Mary Cassatt. Mary Cassatt. Thank you. Mary Cassatt had to leave the country and go to France. But here in the parochial South, according to most of the New York. Boston, Philadelphia triangle of Northeastern artists and, the, and their elite attitude toward things. Let me just show my true colors. Um, uh, that, that, you know, that they, they weren't accepted. Well, guess what? They were in the South. In the South, we had great women artists. And, and, and we need to look no farther in Louisiana what was happening at Newcomb and Tulane. I mean, it was it was it was probably the biggest uh, production line of women in the arts that existed in the United States for from the end of the 19th century, when the when uh, Ellsworth Ward founded the the Newcomb School of Ceramics, and and um, until it went out of existence uh, in the 50s. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and so I have. I have questions specifically about abstraction because that kind of represents yeah. the uh, another important chapter in your work. And as we already discussed, it circles back to a Louisiana artist. And Bradley has outlined this a little bit. But I was curious about your visit to the Phillips collection in advance of this and your burgeoning relationship with abstraction. Yeah, I, I did want uh, uh, Bradley to, to hear this. Uh, so, throughout the, throughout the late 70s into the 80s, there were two people who I, I, I still consider mentors to me in, uh, in, in abstract art. Uh, the, the first was Sidney Bestoff, and uh, who was, I, I built, one of the things I did in the development 
side of my life is a, I think I've built about 15 or 20 KMVs for for Sydney uh, over the, the years and and um, and then Arthur was a close friend and we met when he was just I mean, he was framing and sweeping floors at a at a gallery on Royal Street when Ann and I met met Arthur first met him and I think he was still in high school maybe he was and and um, and then uh, I'll get off on that because I'm so proud of what Arthur has done. I mean, he is the he is the quintessential example of entrepreneur in in in, in the United States, and and I, I'm so proud of him. I could bust, but he was he was on one shoulder, Sydney was on the other. About why don't you start collecting abstract art? Well, I didn't because I wasn't feeling it. I I, I just it didn't. I. And, and I, I have examined before we had a chance to talk in, in relative, relative to this exhibition, I, 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 I realized that I didn't feel like I was worthy. That's the honest truth. I didn't feel like I had the ability and, and, and the study and, uh, to, to understand abstract art until no matter how much those two mentors were on me until I had an epiphany when I saw my first Mark Rothko. And it was a poster before this, this led to the Phillips collection, the Rothko Room. It was a poster of, of Mark Rothko work that was the, the exhibition poster for a major, major um, exhibition that the Houston Museum of Fine Arts was doing of Rothko. And so this would have been back in the very early 80s, maybe around 1980, maybe. And, and, and I loved it. I loved it. I didn't know why I loved it, but I loved it. And, and that gave me that first little spurt of confidence in myself. And, and then um, I was doing some work in Washington and and I, 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 I like to stay at the Ritz-Carlton because I always loved the Phillips collection, but I had never seen the Rothko room. So I went purposely this time. I wanted to go see a, a man. I didn't, wasn't able to get to Houston in the timing of that, that exhibition. So I went and, I, and I, I probably sat in that room uh, for more than 30 minutes just soaking up the the – the the Rothko's in there, and and I had had a previous um, exposure to Rothko's in in, in Houston at uh, at the Rothko Chapel on the St. Thomas uh, University uh, um, campus, right across from the Demille, from the Menil, and and that it was that place. It wasn't so much the Rothko. Um, lining the wall, it took me until after this time after, to appreciate the Rothko's and not just the sense that I felt of, of, of really, it's the most spiritual I've ever felt in a building. Um, I, I'm, I'm a spiritual person. I very, very much believe in God, but I, I, I see God when I'm on the river in Montana. <laughs> and. Uh, Great sunsets like that dismal swamp, the swamp, which is is the Christmas card this year, and I think what then it then it opened up and it says glory, glory, hallelujah. I think yep, and and uh, and so that's where I. But in the buildings, I have seldom felt close to God, and 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 I always did in the Rothko Chapel, even before I understood Rothko. And they are so dark. I mean, they are so dark. I mean, they're basically almost black on black. Uh, and it, they had the Manil family had commissioned him to pe to paint his version of of life after death. It was just all, and it's all dark. If you ever have a chance to go, please go to the Rothko Chapel. There's a Barnett Newman Newman uh, reversed obelisk in the in the in the in the pond outside, the reflecting pond outside. But anyway, so so. Yes, sitting in that in that Rothko room at the at the at the Phillips, who I partly patterned what I wanted to do with making the collection public after, um, with what Duncan Phillips had done. Uh, yes, I got comfortable. I got very very comfortable 
but it was with one artist, you know, and and um, and 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 the closest thing that yes was Ida, who was a friend, uh, and and represented by Arthur, uh, and and so uh, I'm, I'm, you, did, you didn't just buy a piece; you jumped in commission first with the commission and. Mm -hmm. What was that conversation like in terms of commissioning your first acquisition? Well, it was cool. It was cool. Shoot, shoot. My, 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 my great red-headed friend with those turquoise blue eyes and those uh, overly rouged cheeks all the time, she was a spitfire. And she was, uh, she was very direct. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and just, she just, her art looks like Ida, you know, that, including this work. Um, so we, we were friends. And, and so when I reached out to her and, and, and uh, she said, well, I want to come and see the space in which I wanted her to as well. And it was comfortable because we were friends. And so she came, she came over the, 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 the room was an existing room on the house. It was, it, it, but it, we had done a, a, a Guess some, some redesign, interior redesign, and there was a wall that was created over a wet bar, um, and and I wanted to get something special for this. So that's why the commission. You know, the commission was uh, because I had a, 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 a space, a place. And she spent time in there. She did. She came two mornings, and and they were both in the about this time of the year. Go, I think they were in early February, and. If you know the Japanese magnolias in New Orleans, they're almost always on sync with carnival season. And we have these giant original Japanese magnolias that go back to the building of the house in the late, late, late 19th century, 1889, 1890. And so they're big and gorgeous. And, and the, 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 they're on the east side and it's all glass in, I mean, it's a solarium. And, and so the sun, she wanted to come in the morning, the sun's in the east, and it's just coming through those lavender magnolias, and, and the, the, the color of the room was pretty much, you know, close to the wall that you, you did for, for showing this. And, and it just cast this lavender glow over everything for both mornings that she came. And so she, she picked that up in, in, in her, in, in her um, depiction and in her incredible... Um, uh, glyphs, I think you call them, uh, never registers with me why, but anyway, that's what they're called. And, and, and the, 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 the symbols, uh, uh, I, I, I all, I used to question her, not just about this work after you did it, but other works that's okay. I don't, you know, so, so, so <clears throat> I can't remember if so. Those are figs up there in the top right, the black and white ones, you know, aren't they? I, said, mm, I don't think so. I mean, maybe they are. And I said, then then you go to blue figs over here and, and said, I, I don't know. I mean, she was so sincere. I, I, I don't know. And I said, and, and then I said, uh, you know, I said, there, it's kind of a, like a the big blue thing, sort of like a phallic symbol. And she said, well, now that might be. <laughs> And, and so, uh, you know, there was lots of, uh, you know, lots of, uh, of uh, uh, repartee with her and, and uh, I, I, I love this work. Well, and so it's, a, again, like it took a while for you to have a personal relationship with non-objective art. And yes. So now with two more recent additions to your collection, what is your relationship with non-objective art? Well, um, it's like a love affair, you know. Um, it, once that fire is uh, is lit, um, it just roars on. And and I told you this when we first talked that um, uh, people people often will ask curators or collectors, "What's your favorite? What's your favorite work in the collection?" You know, or what's your favorite artist? Um, well, I went from being afraid of abstract art because I felt I wasn't worthy to baby steps to get confidence and, 
and, and mentors encouraging me and Sydney and Arthur. Um, but, but it really didn't take long. Mark Rothko totally lit the fuse. Um, it was, uh, it was um, manifested by Ida in that first work by her. Um, and, and now as we sit here today and for the last 20 plus years, um, uh, I have a love affair with abstract art. And, and so the, the question becomes why? And, and I do understand why. I absolutely understand why. As a, as a former athlete, um, abstract art as, as juxtaposed versus representational art is, is, a, is, a, is, is just such a, a yin and a yang. It's wonderful, I think, in the art world. So the representational art, you, know, you can see something really, really great. And, and then you have to have, because you're confident, it's seeing, it's, it's the original Dristel. It looked like Bayou Tash. It looked like my, my place, my home, uh, and then so on and so on. And, and in, in abstract art, uh, you, 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 I can now tell the difference, and I have been for 20 years, able to use this blessing of the eye to apply that same blessing to abstract art and understand the great from the not so great or really not good at all. Um, and, and there's a confidence that comes from that. But as an athlete, the reason I've fallen in love with abstract art is that we, we can look at, uh, at this Dorothy Hood, the blue, the predominantly blue work right directly behind me. Our, so Bradley and I are having an arm wrestle. We are both in love with Dorothy Hood. You know, and, and we're, we're wrestling over her. Um, fortunately, we team up and she's gone on from this world. Uh, but I've never seen a Dorothy Hood that I didn't, don't love. But I think that first Dorothy Hood that, that, that I bought that was Florence in the morning, I think that's been about 10, 10, 12 years ago, maybe 10, 12 years ago. I didn't know of Dorothy Hood's work. She was basically a Houston-based artist. But... So you look at that blue, and each one of you, including Ben and me, we, we can see what we see in that work. You, know, you can see, you see all kinds of things. You see a black panther emerging out of a blue lava flow on the left. You can see, you know, a big vice, horizontal vice on the right with the very big blue. Or you can see clouds, or you can see lava, or whatever it is that you see. And, and so in athletics, you can sit up in the stands and, and watch a team play, or you can be down on the field or the court and be a player. With abstract art, we all get to be players. And I realized that hearkening back to, uh, to those original conversations with, with Ida when I was asking about the gifts, you know, or, or, the, or the, the symbols. You know, are these figs or these phallic symbol or what? You know, and 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 when you, she, she truly didn't know, um, they just came out, and that's because of the confidence that she had. And so now, with abstract art, you get to play in the game. You're not up in the stands just watching. You get to have your own. It's not just the artist's rendition. Well, and you know. Very much as a, a footnote, again, start in Louisiana, and then you use the term light the bomb, or light a fuse and the bomb exploded, and there's a profusion mm -hmm. of non-objective style mm -hmm. in your collection. Yes. Um, you know, these are two good examples of that. But then you also assembled a phenomenal collection of photography. Um, not too long after that. Almost simultaneously, yeah, yep. You know, and so how did you come to be drawn to Clarence Laughlin's work? Well, Clarence John Laughlin I've become familiar with uh, probably 10 years before uh, with uh, the, his incredibly wonderful publication called Ghosts on the Mississippi, which are essentially images of... of of uh, that he put together over a period of time back in the 1950s, I think that's right. And and you know, what's 
yeah, this is 52. So back in the, so I was familiar with that book and it, and, and it, I always loved it because it's a, there's something about the South that the South as a place that captures the imagination of many, including Europeans, Asians, all across the rest of the U.S., there's an incredible curiosity and interest in things Southern. Uh, I mean, Elvis, you know, what, you know, but there, 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 there is, and it's really true in South Louisiana, there's a certain mystery to the South. There's a certain, people love to come to New Orleans to see the voodoo things and to see uh, uh, see, see the grave of the great uh, the, what's their name? Um, oh, yes, yeah, yep. And 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 Anne Rice's whole literary look yeah. at at the mythic and mysterious side of of New Orleans, and, and that really carries throughout the South. And and so. Um, Clarence John Laughlin's work, as I first saw it in Ghosts Along the Mississippi, it was aptly named. And it was like sort of what I got from it was that he was looking at the past. I think, I think this is this is Bell, this is the Bell Grove, the, the remnants of Bell Grove Plantation. We actually have a other of uh, earlier photograph of, of the in, sort of intact uh, Bell Grove, but it's sort of like he was he was visiting the the mythical ghosts of the South, the where we took a wrong turn with uh, with enslaved people and and, um, and 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 the haunting mystery of it all because he would these that including that particular photographs uh, most of them not all but most of them were um, they were um, planned uh, what's the word I'm looking for uh, Richard what, what what do you call it when 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 they constructed, constructed yes it, it, they, they, the art the artist photographer would construct something not just take a photograph of something uh, as found, you know, and and so he constructed these these very mysterious and haunting, ghost-like ghosts along the Mississippi, um, and it, it it really um, I just boy, this is the South as I feel it. I, this is what I feel about the South. Well, and you know, it goes back to your athletic eye. He also happens to be you know a preeminent American surrealist photographer you know, a early adapter of the style. So, you know, a, just a wonderful addition to your overall collection. And, and here we have others. We have the Bell Grove. That's it. Yeah. Condition. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Eudora Welch. Walker Evans. Yeah. I was trying to, yeah, I thought it was one of the really important. And Elmore Morgan senior, of course, that's, you know, I used to work with the, you know, his great granddaughter. She doesn't work at the museum anymore. We got to yeah. visit with her yesterday. And that's one of my favorite photos in the, you know, I have I've personally connected to that, um, like you are to much of your work. Uh, and, and so what was the, I feel like with photography, when I visit the Ogden Museum, when Bradley's talking about it, there's a great sense of urgency with photography. It's often forefronted. You have a curator of photography at the museum. What's the, what is the added urgency for photography that you feel in the, in, in the field? Well, you know, I, uh, I didn't know this at the time, but you asked me and, and I you know, thought, about, thought about it with you and I thought about it since. And, um, examined my own um, chronology of thinking about it, and I, I, uh, the best I can do, Ben, is that that um, the entrepreneurial thing clicked in big time, <laughs> because when we, when I first started with with Clarence John Laughlin, it was right about 
in the late 70s, 1980, uh, right, right at 80. We're, and very parallel to when I started getting interested in abstract. You're right about that. There's no relationship, yeah. just, just a, a coincidence. But nevertheless, it, it, that happened it, it, almost simultaneously. And, and I saw in, in, in photography way, way over, overlooked great art. I mean, that's the long and short of it is that, uh, and I wanted to be part of bringing attention, just like the collections about bringing recognition to the art and artists of the American South from beginning to the current times. And so I'm excited to see the reinstallation because of that, mm -hmm. the reinstallation of so much of the permanent collection that the Muse Ogden Museum is taking on that we're kind of pre, we're, we're, it's a prelude, this exhibition, Envisioning the South, is a prelude to that. And your desire to share things, to share your work with the public is so important. I'm excited to see this one. <laughs> I've never seen this installed, so I'm very excited. I'll see you in April, uh, Bradley and Richard. Um, as, a, as a conclusion, as a kind of meditation, can you walk through the conversation you had with Mr. Gilliam when you bought this and your desire to share it with the public? So I give credit to Donna Perret, who was then the principal and, uh, of, uh, of um, um, shoot. Simone Stern, yeah, Simone Stern Gallery. She brought Sam to my attention and um, and um, so I first saw through Donna's uh, suggestion, uh, Sam Gilliam's drape paintings. And they were fascinating because they talk about entrepreneurial. There's no frame. There's no frame there. There's no stretcher. It's just free flowing canvas, not constricted by anything foreign. And that's why he was so obsessive about how his drape paintings should be hung. Each one had a specific way that he wanted it hung. Bradley related exactly the way it occurred when he came down to install it in the house. So I flew up to DC and, and met with Sam. And it, 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 you know, there's a saying amongst many curators and collectors that it's amazing how you can really be drawn to a work of art and then you meet the artist and the, that work of art either gets better or worse <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, that's our human nature. You know, it, 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 it may still be a great work of art, but you may not like it as much after you meet a real SOB, you know, and, and uh, Sam and I hit it off. Uh, it was just sparks of personal, um, uh, personal regard and, and, and interest in each other. He was fascinated. This was before the museum was a, a reality, but it was in my head and, and discussions had begun uh, with, with several suitors to, to do it with. And, um, and uh, so uh, he wanted to know all about that before we got talking brass tacks which was acquiring one of these drape paints. So I, I learned in that very early uh, stages of, of uh, doing my homework with Sam Gilliam, uh, that incredible show that he had at the, at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, um, where he draped the, there was an installation where he draped the entire museum in Philadelphia. I mean, it was a huge installation, you know, worthy of some of the, Installa uh, the, the, the installations that we see in installation art became more, more rigor in the, 20, in the 21st century, you know. But, but so Sam, I, I thought this work when I saw it, and especially I saw more in his studio. He showed me ones that he was holding back from museums. Uh, I didn't quite he knew where he was going with it and then he pumped me for more information about how, how determined I was to get this Museum of Southern Art done because he was a Mississippi guy, you know. And, and um, 
and he trusted in me and took me to, he had saved only about 10 or 12 or 13 uh, of the 1970, early 70s vintage, uh, which are the real Drake paintings. He came back to it because they, they started bringing giant sums of money, but, but the real ones are those, those 19, early 70s, the so first half of the 70s works. And, and, um, and, and he, he, the way he stored these was fascinating. They were rolled up on a tube. And so the, the tubes were big and they were heavy. So there's a lot of, and it's heavy canvas. There's a lot of material there. And so we started pulling them out from a bin and he kept these last ones reserved for museums. And, and he said, what do you think? I said, I like that one. And, and we looked at all 10 or 12, whatever they were. And, um, and one that I didn't think was as good was kind of a dark, rusty colored one. And, and uh, yeah, and it was just, uh, this one just popped. And so I said, I really like this one. And he said, you're going to build that museum? You promised me you'll build it, put this in a museum? I said, yes, sir. And I said, how about this, Sam? It was almost like talking my father out of the car to go in. I said, how about, how about this, Sam? I'll make a deal with you. If I fail, and I could, you know, if I fail to get this museum launched, um, then... I will sell it back to you for what you sold it to me. He said, deal, done. So I get it. He came down, installed it. Was within less than a, was within 24 months after that. After I acquired it, it was installed in the home. It was in the stairwell originally. It was so cool. Bradley, you, you know, you took that from us, you know. Oh, it says I gave it. Oh, okay. All right. Ken still fusses at me about that one. So at any rate, um, um, I'm in D.C., back in D.C. And the other, the big major museum that I love most in the world um, that I've seen is also in D.C., and it's the National Gallery. I, 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 I love the National Gallery. I love the West Wing with the, the antiquities and the East Wing uh, and you see, we kind of use that as a model to develop our museum with the Gold Ring Hall being the modern the equivalent to the East Wing and, and the library equivalent to the West Wing on just much more intimate uh, levels um, with the historical art. Um, I, 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 I went into the East Wing, went down the tunnel and from the West Wing to the East Wing and, and I walked in. I always loved walking in from that tunnel as opposed to the, that entrance. And... And they always show their most recent prized acquisition of contemporary art, modern art, uh, on a, a wall along the stairwell that goes up to the loft area. And there was <laughs> the one I rejected. <laughs> Sam's rust colored in, at the National Gallery. And, 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 and that helped my confidence a whole hell of a lot. <laughs> that's awesome well thank you for a fantastic evening last night a super morning a super morning this morning and I, we're a little over time but i think we probably have a, a little bit if anyone has questions um you know we're about five minutes till but yeah Yes, but he had a photograph of it. Okay. So for each of the roles, he had a photograph of, of them hung. And so, you know, it was really, uh, it, it, I don't, what, Ken, was it a, Sam spent four or five hours and he had a team, had a couple of assistants with him. And so it, it was about a five hour, five hour installation. But yeah, it was, it was a photograph company. look but those I'm oh, sorry those kinds of things always just I don't understand how they place it so particularly you know that's why they're the master artists and we're not you know I mean I mean it, it 
Sam was a magical human being, much like I feel about Elmore Morgan down here. He was a magical person, and his art was equally importantly magical. Well, Sam was one one of those guys, and and, and you know, I I I I, I, I beg. Bradley and William and Richard all the time. Please, please, please. Let's not. All the curators of today want to go political, social justice, all these kind of. Please, please, please. Let us always be an institution that buys art for great art's sake. <laughs> and and that that applied to this because. Other than the Philadelphia Museum that did that big Sam, Sam had not been have he hadn't had any great recognition. Now today, so Bradley, these straight paintings you and I see them from time to time in in the on the, on the auction, and they're not even 1970s. So, so they since he came out and was discovered by the Northeast elitist museum world, and then it became the rigor. Everybody had to have a Sam Gillen. Well, this old bumpkin, or what did my mother call us? The you two oafs, yeah, yeah. This old oaf saw it back in nineteen in the nineteen eighties or early nineties, and and uh, I didn't care what color he was. I didn't care whether he he was a great artist, and 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 I I also like Bradley some of Sam's uh, 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 wood based work. He gave the museum for auction uh, a carve out of an oak tree that was very reminiscent of one of Ben's, uh, uh, there are two Morgans in the show, and one is called Oak Shape. And, and unbeknownst, unbeknownst to each other, um, Sam did this carve out of an oak tree. Do you happen to remember that? or? It, it, it's up in Montana. So I'm keeping as far away from you and, and William as I possibly can. But I'll, it, be, I'll be in Idaho in April. I'm yeah. going to drive right over. <laughs> uh -oh. So it needs to be shown with Elmore's oak shape. It's, it's coming to you. But yeah, I, I love some of his other work, some of his later work where he moved off the, the drapes and back into hard, uh, hard work. But yeah, that's, that's the magic of artists. So how... How, abstract artists in particular, how do they know to, to uh, uh, how do they know to uh, put a touch of red here? Or what, even in academic art, that Malay, if you go back to that Malay, go back to that Malay levy and then I'll hush up. Yeah, so I was looking at it with Ken last night and, and the, the whole structure of his composition is this giant crescent. Well, guess what? It's Crescent City and the, and the river's making a big crescent that, the, lot, that the, the, the levee is following. But so what does he do to draw your eye deep into, deep into the recesses of the painting? Well, if you look along the levee about half, a little bit past halfway, but where the real curves are, you'll see he's got two people and one is in a sort of bright orangey red, and 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 then there's some there's some uh, 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 there's some infrastructure stuff that's that's on the horizon, I think, but it's uh, it's also looks like it's sitting on top of the left. Anyway, he he is drawing us as we look at the work. He's drawing us to go along that levee pathway and pull us further into the painting, and he was the only. Only Louisiana painter uh, elected to the National Academy of Arts. Um, I, I, is it still, Bradley? Is it still? I don't know that. It's, well, it was certainly through the 1950s and 60s, and, and there was a reason why. He was a brilliant, he was a brilliant conceiver and executioner of art. And, and, and it's how they know how to hang the, <laughs> how to hang the canvas. And, and, and how to paint and draw our eyes to the full picture plan. All right. Okay. Yeah. Oh. oh. One last question. Okay. One last question. It's really not a question. It's more of a, a, a thank you. Uh, you've done so much to elevate and preserve Southern art, but you're also nurturing 
Southern artist, mm -hmm. emerging artist. Uh, this, this last summer, uh, Robert Hill, who is a student at the University of New Orleans in art history, uh, who may become someone we're celebrating or our children are celebrating in this room 50 years from now, or he may not, he may just become a curator, who knows? But you gave him an, an internship this last summer at the Ogden Museum of Southern Art. And there could not have been a better incubator for his creativity, for his, his interest in art, and more importantly, just his, his gratefulness that someone took an interest in him. And Roger, I don't know how many times you've done little things like that for Louisiana and Louisianans and artists, but every one of those, when you add them up, is really the definition of who you are. Hmm. And I wanted to point that out in that one example. Uh, Robert will be going with me to France. With, uh, is he going years. with the group? He's with going you? with it. Yeah. And I can't wait for him to see some of the greatest artists he's ever seen. But he got to work with those artists this last summer because of you and the Augie Museum. And I just wanted to thank you for well, that. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. And, and that does it. And that does. Um, that does prompt one last thing, and we're, we'll, unless anybody has a question, and I'll be happy to hang around a little bit. Um, so, but, so, Jim, without William, Bradley, our entire crew, Richard, Amy, I see her up there. I see, I think I see Selena up there. Um, um, and everybody was here last night, you know, the whole crew. It, it, without them, so what I did was I recommended Robert to them. And, and, and then, and, and they don't always take my recommendations, trust me. <laughs> they, don't, they don't, but, but I recommended it and then they did everything after that. And, and you know that from your positions of being president of a university to being president of the university system, you know that you can set a course um, in, in a leadership position, but if you don't have the people who can execute that course and then have their own vision to add to yours, um, you know, it's not going to be as good. So I just want to say that and same thing with Ben and, and Luann and, and, you know, all the team here. Um, it's, uh, it, it is, it, it, it you know, I'll just close with this. I, I wanted to say this last night, but there have been so many things that I just did. So one of the wrestling matches that I have with, with, with uh, Bradley and William and people who get to do what I love for a career and actually get paid for it, you know, I, I'm just spending fields inheritance. <laughs> I don't, but the stuff that they get to do uh, I ask them all the time. Bradley's tired of hearing it. Where does this come from, this stuff that you get to play with, you know, that you get to do this incredible work with, but, you, you know, they're your babies. Where does that come from? And every virtual, every major collection, every major museum in the world, and in a, uh, I want to bring it down to America, because in America, it comes from some capitalist or group of capitalists who create the value to be able to philanthropically give these things to where they belong to the people. And, and in Europe, it was the, I mean, Joy, you should know this firsthand. It was either the throne or the Vatican. <laughs> he was, Last year he was king of Joan of Arc, and, and, and this is Joe's uh, partner. He was king of, of, uh, of uh, Joan of Arc last year, and this year he was the pope. And I, I sent Joe a, a text that was over a weekend when I learned about it, and I said, this man is power man. He wants to not only be king, he wants to be pope. But it, all kidding aside, it was the patronage of those. Now, in America, it's capitalists. It's whether you talk about melon, Carnegie, just think of all the vanilla, uh, all that dirty oil, uh, you know. Um, and, 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 and so if we can just get everyone to balance out and understand that there is, there is a role for creating value and uh, that betters society and then 
then there is, um, you know, there are governors that need to be on, on, on we capitalists to be sure that we don't screw up more than we create value. But, but make no mistake, it, it's, it's that beautiful balance of, of those who delve in the liberal arts and the, the open-minded thinking of, of the academy of universities and, and museums. Um, a lot of the stuff that they, that they are able to apply their trade comes from the creation of value. And, and that's capitalist. So we don't need to put each other down. We need to work together. So that's, that's it. True. And thank you, Roger. And yeah. thank you, Otsu Marino, for presenting this today. We really appreciate it.